Hello and welcome to the 50th edition of Talking With. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Peter Harrison, Group Chief Executive of Schroders. Peter, welcome and thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, thank you. How did you get into the industry? By accident. So, uh, like most graduates, I, I applied for a whole range of jobs and of course, management consultancy seemed to pay well and going into the city seemed to pay well and, and I, I ended up at Schroders, didn't really know my way around the, the, the accepting houses, but, and I was at University of Bath who didn't have a careers office, so um, I wrote these letters and was very surprised to get in because no one from Bath ever seemed to have gone to a merchant bank before. I arrived on the graduate training programme and discovered I was a social experiment of a non-Oxbridge graduate and the non-Oxbridge graduates were sent to asset management and the smart Oxbridge graduates were sent into the investment bank. So I found myself on day one uh, as, a, as an analyst in, in the asset management the business in a building down the road from the main head office in a little building in Old Jewry. When you set out, did you have aspirations to become chief executive or did you think that's where you would end up? I had not a, not a hope at all. No, no, I mean, I was surrounded by very smart people who all seemed to be far cleverer than I was at doing everything that was done. And I, I, I remember I only ever went up to the top floor once and that was to give my resignation. And I, and I dutifully laid my envelope down on the table after three years and said, I wanted to go off and do this thing. And I was told, nobody ever leaves Schroeder's. And I finished this half hour conversation. The envelope was still sitting there. And I thought, what do I do? What am I supposed to do now? So I picked it up and put it back in my pocket, which was the most schoolboy error, because of course I had to go back the next day and give it back in. But I, so I never actually, um, never thought I'd dreamed of, of going back to the top floor ever again. I'm terrified by it. Well, they got you back in the end, didn't they? So, <laughs> so and, and what was your path? So, how did your career unfold? Well, very accidental. I, I, I effectively started work. I was, I was, a, I was a geeky programmer, um, really, having done a business degree. So I was sent to sort of sort out does this business make money and can you, can you figure it out by downloading things on the computer? And then I was given the first, um, the first PC on the investment floor when I became an analyst um, to do the, the allocations. And I was the only person who could use Lotus, so you know, I was given all the jobs. And, and, and bit by bit, the, the, I, I spent time as an analyst in the UK. I, I moved to Newton, which was a very strange experience because you, give, you don't realise the power of a brand until you don't have one. And, and the, uh, Spent three years at Newton being introduced as, this is Peter Harrison. He worked at Schroeder's, you know. So, so that was, that, and then from, from Newton, um, joined Flemings, where post the merger with JP Morgan, I did more and more, of, uh, did some corporate integration. And, and like all investors, you got dragged into doing more and more other things, which, which I realised there were lots of people who were smarter than me at investing, and found myself doing general management stuff. And ultimately ended up um, moving to a tiny little business um, out, out of real desire to, to, you know, it was just before the crisis, I thought that there's, there's more fun to be had in this industry than, than with, with big companies. And I, I, what became RWC, and we, you, know, you learn that you put the toilet rolls together, you sign the toilet roll holders together, you, you have to learn to sign a lease, you put up the shelves from IKEA, you learn what a CCAV fund range is, and you learn what general management was. And that was the time when I learnt my trade, really. Those, those five or six years. And what does, a, what does a day entail? So now that you're Chief Exec of Schroders, I mean, what does your day-to-day -day job entail? What decisions do you have to make? Which are the hard decisions? Okay. Yeah, well, the hard decisions are the people decisions, undoubtedly. I mean, to my mind, you know, if, you, if you get the people things right, everything else follows. You get the people right, the culture right, then actually the business decisions, the actual decisions about which funds to launch, which acquisitions to make, you know, which partnerships to do, that, th those are relatively straightforward. They're common sense in a, in a sense given, but, but I think you've got to be, a, for me, you've got to be an aggressive student of what's going on in the outside world. It's too easy in our industry to look in. And I think spending a lot of time looking out and see, seeing, seeing what the context of what you're doing is. But uh, yeah, that requires a, just a, a lot of hours. You know, it's an early start, it's a late finish, it's too many dinners, but that's, that's the world we live in, right? So now you are chief exec, what does that role entail? And how do you find the time to do everything? <sighs> I mean, the key bit about the role is, is, is getting a team together of the right people. So getting, getting an environment where the right people want to come and join. Um, You've, you've obviously got different stakeholder groups. You've got you've got shareholders. You've got the market. You've got you know a lot of client things that you that are absolutely front and centre, and you've got to do to keep in touch. Um, but 
the, the bit that I think is really key now, and, and I think has been unimportant for the last 15 years, is the strategy. Because this industry is changing more quickly than ever, and therefore thinking about how you move your feet and how you change is the bit that keeps me awake at night and where I spend most of my time. And so are those are the day-to-day -day decisions you have to take. Obviously, strategy is, is a long-term thing, but what are the day-to-day -day decisions well, you have to take? And but, what are the hard ones? Well, the hard ones are always the people ones. Because you, know, you 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 have to you have to keep evolving and have to keep changing and and so that, that, that they're the hardest and the most important judgments we make, but I think there's you know, strategy is, is a long term thing but that's you've got the, the, if you like the framework but every day there's a decision about you know do we fund this fund do you know are we are we going fast enough do we make this acquisition do we hire this team. Are we, are we doing enough in you know, thematics? Are we doing enough in these other areas? And that, that to my mind, is, is the day-to-day -day manifestation strategy. And that's what I need to do, is to make sure we're holding the organisation's feet to the fire to, to run hard enough at a time of change. And Schroeder's now is two, over, over 200 years old. Yeah. I'm going to do that bit again. Schroeder's now is over 200 years old. It's existed in different guises, in merchant banking, asset management, now looks more like asset management and wealth management. What does the Schroeder's of tomorrow look like? That's a really, really important question. And I, if I had a silver, it's really hard. Um, if I had a, had a glass ball even, I'd, I'd look into it. But I think there's, there's one, the two major changes. I, I think we may well look back in 10 years time and say, these things called mutual funds and ETFs are really old fashioned. Um, you know, the, the, if, you, if, you, if you really think about it, we, we limit ourselves to, to, to public companies and wrappers, which in the US they call 1940 Act funds. The clue's in the name. This stuff is really, really old fashioned. So mass personalization and blending public and private, to my mind, we'll see the regulations start to change, that we can buy tokens, we can invest in private companies, and that coming together of public and private may well make the business look very different in years to come. And do you think that will be the preserve of the retail investor as well, access to investments such as that? Yeah, I think, I think it will end up being some... I mean, why, why, why would it not be? Why, why would you not want something tailored to you personally, advised in a way which is, is, is you know, supported by huge huge amounts of, of, of breadth rather than you know being stuck in UK equities which is a, a, if you th think about it no one wakes up in the morning and needs UK equities they need a, an answer to their, their long-term savings problem and that's clear then in this in the sort of seven growth areas you've laid down for Schroeder's it is covering different types of investments Do you want to talk a little bit more about that yeah I mean we, we well at its at its core we said we want to be closer to the consumer we want to, we want to we want to make our products more accessible to people and, and, and more easy to understand and getting that you know, whether whether it be at one level through multi asset or solutions but actually in a whole raft of, of, of different different ways and the Lloyd's joint venture is is one manifestation of that um, and on the other hand we've got to have a good access to good private assets. Um, because if you, if you take the view that in the long term, you know, buildings will be tokenized, companies will be tokenized, all the, all, the, all the best businesses are not on public markets these days. So how are we gonna, how are we gonna get access to those? And, and if you blend those two things together, you can effectively turbocharge the growth of your core business. And thinking longer term, Schroeder's has a family behind it, a, a, a large stakeholder. What are the benefits or indeed the challenges of having a long-term family shareholder in the business? I think they're immense. They're, they're, they're most important at a time of, a time of big change because you can take that 10-year, 15-year view of what's happening and saying, actually, we, we want to incubate this. So um, we, we're incubating an infrastructure capability in Paris. You know, we started with nothing. It's grown very significantly. It's very hard to do that if you're on a quarterly treadmill. So the very first thing I did when I took over was got rid of quarterly earnings. It was just a way of saying to the organisation, don't stop and worry about flows. Worry about client outcomes, but don't worry about flows. And sadly, Bruno Schroeder passed away the other day. Yeah. Um, everybody will miss him terribly. Did, did he, I mean, do you have any special memories of oh. Bruno or any special advice he gave yeah. you? Yeah, many, many special memories. He was an amazing guy. His passion for this business was phenomenal. You know, he would never, never miss the opportunity to be present and, 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 and very, very clear about it. But the best thing was he said, I want something which is a 20 year view. And he used to sit down, sit me down regularly, we'd have a cup of tea and he said, give me the 20 year view. The guy was 86. 
and he wants a 20 year, you've got to admire the family. But if you think about the history of the business, it had been able to make those inflections over time and, and, and see through that change. And that's what Bruno was trying to reinforce. And, and so you know, two things the family give us, one is that long-term perspective, but a willingness to carry a, a, a really conservative balance sheet. And if you think you're somewhere near the end of the cycle, a strong balance sheet is going to be critical because you'd be able to invest through that downdraft when I think you know, a lot of people will be saying, ooh, it's scary. But if you can invest through it, we know ultimately this is a growth industry. And that's, that's the thing we've got to get right. And that's exactly what he said, actually, when they sold the bank back in 2000 yeah, and, the, and the long-term view and getting behind yeah. asset management. And when I joined here in 88, I had no idea that asset management, then the poor relation, and we were on two floors of a little building in Old Jewry, would end up being... Yeah, the bit that was called Trovers. So we hear about the importance of culture in an organisation. What do you think is the right culture or the important ingredients of culture yeah, in, yeah. in your business? I, I, critical question. And look, I don't think there's, there's a right answer, but the number that I live by is what proportion of your staff say they're proud to work for Schroders? And, and we're running at over 90%. So somewhere in there, there's the ingredients that people want to come to work. So some, for, for some people, it's a physical environment. Some people, it's, it's, a, it's a pacey environment. For some people, it's, a, it's an environment where they can be really professional and worry about clients. For some, it's about collaboration, having the right technology. Um, but, but somehow, we've got to be willing, we've got to be capable of bringing in really, really talented people. And if we find talented people, we want them to come, be able to come and work with us. And we want to keep people. And, and I think staff retention has been a huge advantage for us over the years. So I don't think there's a... I wish I had, I wish I had a, a formula which said this is right, but, but when, you, when you get it right and the, and the motor's ticking and you feel that people are happy and engaged and they're, they're innovating and they're moving quickly, that feels to me like the sort of place that, that I want to come to work in. And I think that right now we're in a, we're in a moment that feels pretty good on those things. And the, and, and the trick is to get that to permeate right through yeah. the organisation. And again, that must present its challenges. Isn't it? Yeah, it, well, it, it does because you know sometimes you feel like you're, 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 you, you can you can make you can give your orders from the from the from the flying deck, but but if, unless it, they're felt across the and, that, and that's puts a huge emphasis on communication, which is why things like this actually video is is brilliant and the voicemails and stuff to try and you know, be visible in the business. And the biggest failing of all is thinking you've, you've got to everybody because you can never get to everybody, you can never say it enough times. And, um, and fund managers are obviously a, a critical part of this organisation. Um, how do you create, or what's, how do you create the right environment for fund managers? Look, I, I spent 25 years as a fund manager and, I, and, I, and I, was diff I knew I was different from the fund managers I was working with, so I don't think there's, a, there's, there's not one answer for all fund managers. But what I'm probably proud of is when you see people like Andrew Rose who worked with us for 38 years and he did the same job and he was happy to do it because we, we, we created an environment where he was happy to come to work. We gave him the tools he needed. We gave him you know, access to data people, access to, to great systems. We didn't get in his way. We paid him appropriately for, for what it was doing and, and, and there was participation on the upside. And what, what, what do fund managers really want? They want to be able to deliver well for their clients. I mean, that's, that's ultimately, they, they don't want, they, don't, they, they hate losing money for their clients because that's what they have to sit in front of and answer. So everything that you do to enable a portfolio manager to be good at his job is positive. And everything you do to get in the way of that is a negative. So you just do a lot of the former and not much of the latter. And do you have a view on um, the balance between star managers and teams of people? Yeah. I don't think it's as necessarily as simple as that, but the, the reality of it, there are some real stars. I think in the world of, of the information we have today, it's harder and harder to be the individual because you need, I think, a data science capability to distill out what's going on. You need people to be watching. The intensity of it has gone up more and more. You know, the gone are the days where you can look at the non-farm payroll, you know, pick up the phone, have a few, sell it the next day and make some money. That doesn't exist. That statement's been read algorithmically before you've even click the button. So uh, I think teams becoming more important and I think the uh, ability and uh, thinking about what does a good team constitute is becoming more and more important. And I think running money at scale requires bigger teams because capacity is, is a really big issue for our industry. And, and you know, we always forget that, that actually markets are shrinking. You know, the, the, in, in, in aggregate, the number of public companies in this world has fallen very significantly in developed markets over the last 20 years. The growth has been in emerging. 
and, and therefore the amount of money that individuals can run actually is, is, not, is not going up at a rapid rate. In fact, in many cases, it's shrinking. You've got to be willing to be closed mandates. And that's tough. It's tough on everybody. But that, that scale thing comes if, if, you, if you've got a good team, you can potentially eke out some more returns in corners that the star couldn't find himself. I know you're very passionate about diversity and mental health issues, mm. if you like. How do you ensure that these are understood properly and taken seriously? Yeah. I think something like 93% of the people who join asset management firms join from within our industry. So how do you have diversity of thought when all you do is go and hire your competitors? So to my mind, going outside the industry is, is, is critical. And having more different perceptions. Some of the most interesting people we've hired have been from the motor racing industry or some, from completely odd places. So, so that's one is... is Diversity is not just gender diversity. But secondly, is you've got to make sure that where you, where you are sponsoring a type of diversity, you do it from the top of the firm and you do it really strongly and you hold people's feet to the fire because actually what you find is there's a, a marzipan layer within the business that actually doesn't, doesn't really think this has got anything to do with them. If you think, what, what, you know, what, what's, what's the real business of asset management? It's solving problems. And solving problems are best done by more diverse groups. So it, this is not a, a politically correct, nice thing to do. This is something which makes your business better. But I, I think it comes as much from social diversity as it does from gender diversity or race diversity. And on the mental health side oh, of things? Yeah. I mean, I, I had a real learning about mental health when um, I would met somebody at a... At a, at a Samaritan's function. And I was there for personal reasons rather than, than corporate reasons. And, and he said, well, look, well, can I come and present? And, and, I, and then suddenly found that we filled our auditorium on, on mental health discussion. And then we said to our staff, can we have you know, any volunteers to tell a mental health story? And we thought we might get one or two. We were inundated with people on our own staff who said, yeah, and no, I've got this story to tell. And suddenly we realized that actually mental health in the city was a much, much bigger issue than any of us had realized. And, and once we got our head around it and, and you know, got a, we got a whole series of speakers and, and helpers, actually great night bringing Ruby Wax in to talk about <laughs> mental health. But, but you know, those sort of things. And, and we started to, to, to realise that this is, a, this is a stressful job and we ask a lot of people and actually you've got to, you've got to address the downside of that. And, and, so, and so that's pro providing uh, sort of listening ear, sharing experiences, uh, and individual help. And, where it's and a culture where it's, it's okay. Yeah. A, a culture where it's, where it's perfectly okay to put your hand up. And a culture where it's, it's expected that you keep an eye on somebody and say, actually, you know, put your arm around them and say, you know, can I help? Yeah. And specifically mental health? I think mental health is probably one of the most challenging issues within our square mile. I, I had no idea the issue that we face until I, I, was a, I invited someone to come in, um, more from personal experience, um, and talk about it. And, and what, what I found was that suddenly we had an auditorium full of people. And then we said, are there any volunteers to make a video about mental health issues? We had more supply than we, we could possibly cater with. And what we uncovered was there was a huge mental health issue, and actually around the whole of the, whole of the city, because we do very demanding jobs, we ask a lot of people, and people have accidents in their lives, or, or things happen in their families, or things happen at work. And you've got to have a culture where you can put your arm around people, people are looking out for each other, and you accept it is a very, very big part, and it affects us all. And, and that, that culture needs to exist every day in the firm to look out for one another. And I think it's, it's, we'll never solve it, but we can, we can really help deal with it. And you can provide the support, yeah. or some of the support Absolutely. that people need. Yeah. Yeah. Moving on to the industry, I mean, the industry is not particularly trusted amongst investors. We've got regulators uh, pouring over everything that we do. The, 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 the media yeah. um, don't hold the industry in, in the greatest of light. And in fact, a survey a couple of years ago suggested that investors don't too. What does the industry need to do to regain trust with investors? A lot. I mean, and I think, you know, if I can be controversial, things like PRIPs really don't help because we, we, we put out information which is, is actually suggesting that fund pricing is different from what it is with negative, negative transaction costs and fact sheets which are predicting performance. So, so not all regulation is helpful in this regard. But I think the reality is we have to speak to people. We have, we, we have a very fragmented, highly disintermediated business and that makes it very hard for messages to get from portfolio manager to end client and the context of someone's whole portfolio being understood. 
And I think we, we, we shroud it in you know, our own words, which don't mean much to the real world. And so we, you know, we need plain English. We need a lot more transparency. We need more, more talking about pounds and pence rather than percentages and compound growth rates. And, and we need to help people understand what their investment actually means for them. If people, people want to invest in things that they can relate to. And I think there's a huge opportunity here around sustainability and ESG that I think that most people want to, wants their money to do more than simply grow. If you can say it will grow and it will have some social benefit on the other side, and it's not going to cost you anything, but we are going to hold those companies' feet to the fire to deliver more, we're going to be able to connect with people in a way which we haven't done. Because, because people, you know, yes, savings is important, but people also have this, this other you know, recognition that society and capitalism is broken as it is. And I think that that may well help reconnect us in a, in a, in a bigger way to people's savings, if they can relate to what it's doing for, for wider society. Uh, and you personally uh, are involved in, in, in this, particularly through your role with the IA as well. Do you see that as a way of getting the industry to work yeah. together and communicate properly with investors to help them understand what we're about and how we can help solve their problems? The reason I took on chair of the IA was, was precisely this, that, that, that I don't think this is, a, this is an individual firm matter. This is the industry collectively, you know, be it advisors, be it fund managers, be it administrators have to come together to say, actually, how do, how do we help people save better? You know, the, the reality is that we've gone from a defined benefit savings world where it was the corporate's problem to defined contribution where we are, as an industry, a, a doorstep issue. 75% of households use our products. We need to get that right. And if we have a bear market, we've got to, we've got to be really clear about what it is the role of people save. Too many people have said, I'm going to buy a house, a buy-to-let house, rather than save and use a pension. Where, how are we addressing that? How are we making what we do meaningful? And that, that's the bigger problem. And I think that's, that's the industry challenge, which is, for me, the IA's got a role to play. And, and also, you know, we've got to work with regulators to make that feasible. We've got to work with politicians to make that feasible. We've got to create new types of products that allow people to get access to things that they can relate to, because I think the index is, is, a, is a pretty poor proxy for, for that. And that's all going to require change. So your day's getting busier by the minute. <laughs> so that, so that, that addresses or, or seeking to address, if you like, our current markets. What about appealing to the next generation of investors? Uh, how attractive is that? Mm. How important is it? What are you doing about that? Well, I, I don't think the next generation of investors are fundamentally that different. They've got to understand what are their, what are their investments doing for them, how they relate to solving their problems. They're Arguably, but I, I think this is changing quite quickly, they're, they're arguably more concerned about the wider societal implications of their investments. But I think, actually, that, 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 as a 52-year-old, that affects me as, as much as it does, it does them. But we've, so we've got, to, we've got to address that, that social issue as well as part of investing. And I think we, we won a very interesting mandate the other day from a, uh, an American pension fund that said, I don't just want you to deliver those returns, I want you to demonstrate impact. And for me, that, that is representative of where the future is, that, that this next group of savers say, do something with my savings which are above and beyond something that's just for me, but make it relevant to me. And that's where I think the challenge of saying, does a UK equity fund or a European equity fund really answer their question? How, how do we make that, that point of personalization Ad address their needs, their specific need, because you go to Starbucks, you get a coffee which is pretty well personalised to what you want. But when you get your mutual fund, it's, it's, it's yeah, what's on the shelf. But that's achievable. So that that level of information, that level of detail, that level of personal or personalisation, that's achievable in your. Opinion. I think yeah, I think it's it's it's, a, it's the next iteration from here. But does the technology exist? Yes. Does the aggregation see through exist? Um, does, does the, um, our understanding of individuals exist? Well, it's getting there, but you know, tech companies would certainly say that they, they would know enough you know, to understand life events. So, so we, we, you know, we, we need to come together and do this. And, and, and I think part of the, the challenge of the industry is it's a, in a comfortable place, it's highly fragmented, it's not very concentrated. Making that next change is gonna be a tough one, unless there's an exogenous shock. So what piece of advice would you give to someone who wants to join the industry today? Look, this industry is, is really well suited to somebody who is collaborative, smart, innovative, wanting to change and, and 
you know, has very high integrity. So, so if, you, if you're none of those things, don't bother. Um, but the same, if, if, if you do, then I, I think be willing to really think hard about that, that 10 or 15 year view. What, 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 what's changing and be part of the change. That, that for me is the, is the really exciting bit. And, and, and I think that there's gonna be a lot of change, but it's gonna be a very exciting change. You're clearly a very busy man. What do you do when? What do you do to relax? Do you ever get time to relax? I've only ever been in the investment world, so I, this is this is you know I, I call it call it dull, but you cut me in half, and I I I, I love this. It is absolutely fascinating. So yeah, I, I, I you know I've got a couple of young kids. They keep me very busy. They drive me mad. Um, that you know I have to do the school run this morning. That those, those things have to be done. But for me, this is this is you know this is fun as well as. Not fun. <laughs> and one final question. I know you've been a big supporter of Cascade yeah. over the, over the yeah. last couple yeah. of years. What are you planning this year? Oh, Cascade has been, I mean, I, I, to, hugely to, to Helen's credit, has been, I think, one of those great things that's really brought the industry together. So last year I did the you know, abseil off a building, which I thought, oh, I'm not, not very good at heights, a bit, bit stupid. So I, I was challenged Phil Middleton to say, you know, what are we going to do this year, Phil? He said, well, let's do a skydive. And rather foolishly, as I was on the phone, sort of slightly alpha male, said, yeah, great, no problem at all, yeah. And then the date came through, and I thought, okay, I'm doing a skydive. So I'm leaping out of an airplane Good somewhere in that. Dorset. Good luck with that. <laughs> Peter, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk, talk with you and to hear your views, and thank you for making the time. No, thank you, Richard. It's been a real privilege.